Good morning. Will you stand with us? We get to worship God together. Have your way today, Lord.
that you're here. If you are a first time guest with us, we invite you to. <laughs> yeah. Do I need to start over? <laughs> okay. Okay. If you are a first time guest with us, um, welcome. And um, we'd love to get to know you after the service just to say hi and give you a gift. And so if you could catch up with one of those people dressed in a black shirt, um, they would love to um, just say hi and give you a gift, which I already said. But um, <laughs> so um, again, we're glad you're here. So um, I just have a little something I'd like to share before we go back into worship. Um, when the Israelites were in the wilderness, and the Lord spoke to Moses and said, gather the people because the Lord wanted to share his heart with them. And the people were terrified of the Lord's presence. And so they told Moses, you go, you go and let us stay here. And I just want to encourage each of us today that the Lord's heart is to be with his people and his presence is here and he is good, and his heart is good for you. Amen. He just wants good for you. And so we are invited today to come into his presence with open hearts and know that he wants to heal broken hearts. He wants to heal those who are hurting. He wants to heal your infirmities. He wants to set you free. And um, he wants to touch you in whatever way you need to be touched today. So as we go back into worship, I just encourage you to come with your hearts and open up and just let him work his good in you. So Father God, we just thank you and praise you. You are awesome, you are mighty, you are fearful, you are powerful, and you are gracious. You are full of compassion and of tender mercies, and you are good to us. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us the eyes to see your heart for us, Lord, today, that you would reveal yourself to us in a deeper way. We thank you and praise you, and we worship you because you are worthy. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind? Of weight, it was my tomb when I met you. I was breathing, but not alive.
great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to
Day and night, and night and day. 
serve the glory. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. You are Lord. For from you are all things. To you are all things. You deserve the glory. I'm so to you are all things you deserve the glory will you just worship him right now you're the lord of lords you're the king of kings so worthy lord so started it off by talking about how God wants to meet you. God wants to be where you're at. God loves you. And so we, saw, we sang the song about, I ran out of that grave. And then we sang the song about how Jesus is our living hope. And then we sang this song about, for from you are all things. Everything that you need, I want to tell you, is here in the house today. And so I, I asked Sarah, before we sing this next song, you got to come running. And for some of you, you may be in a place of death that has no life. Like Lazarus. And he's calling you out of that place of death, that place of hopelessness. That place beyond where your faith can reach. It's too hard. It's too difficult. It's too impossible. And he's calling you out today. And Lazarus came forth. And then as we were singing this living hope, and it got me excited already for Easter. How many of you know you don't have to get excited about the resurrection story on April 4th, on one day of the year? So that he takes me to Luke. And we know the story how... They're met at the tomb. And he says, go tell the disciples and Peter that he is risen. So then the Lord takes me to Luke chapter 24. And they share with them what they had heard. And in verse 11, it says, they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. However, Peter got up and what did he do? He ran to the tomb. I want to tell you this morning, if you are in a place of defeat, 
If you are in a place of failure, if you want to know, will God forgive me? Will God do more? Can there be something better for me? Can I have my second chance? You need to run to the altar today. But it gets better. Man, the first service was more pumped up than you guys are. (laughs) And then he takes me in the study we've been doing in, in Mark. And it talks about a demon possessed man. Nobody could control this guy. But what happens when he encounters Jesus? He said this in verse 6 of Mark chapter 5. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. Shouted, what do you want with me, son of the most high God? For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you evil spirit. I want to tell you, chains can be broken today. You can run to the altar in the midst of your addiction in the midst of your brokenness into a place that has you bound by your emotions, by your thoughts, by whatever it is that held you captive. And I want to tell you, even demons bow before the throne of God. And so the song that we're going to sing is, nowhere else would I rather be. I want more. So there is more. Maybe you're not ready to run. But we find in Luke's gospel, the story of the prodigal son. And as he's a great distance off, do you know what the dad said to that son? He ran to him. He ran to his broken son, his addicted son, his defeated son. He ran to him. Why? Because for from you are all things. So everything the son needed, the father gave him. And you know what? He gave him even more than what he gave him before. That is our inheritance, friends. That is what church is about, where we run to God and God runs near to us. It's not just to sing good songs or sound good or feel good. It's I got to get to God. I got to get to him because I'm nothing without him. This place where I'm at, it's I want more. And he's ready to give you more, friends. So I don't know, if does this seem like nonsense to you today? Or are you like Peter and said, I got to see for myself. Because that's what I need. I need to be restored. I need to know that there's more. I need to know that it's better than what life is right now. No matter what your condition, friends, he's got more for you. Are you ready for more? We want to continue in worship. If you're ready for more, I invite you to stand. You can come forward. You can run to the altar. You can stay in your seats. I don't know what it is, but I know God has so much more for you. If you are willing to just listen and obey and just say, God, I want more. So before we can sing, can we just close your eyes? If you're new here, we'll talk about this in a second. It's okay. But if you're comfortable, would you just lift your hands as a sign of surrender? What's your condition today? I got a loving father that wants to give you more. But you got to be willing to run to him. You got to be willing to come to him and say, all right, this is it. This is, this is my stuff. But God, I'm running because I know you're running to me. It's not just what happens if I run? Is God going to do anything back? What's going to happen? Friends, he's already running to you. He sees your hands right now. He sees your heart. Guess what? He's already running. He's already running. Let him run to you. Let him give you what you need. Let him give you what you need. Let him give you what you need. Let him break those chains. Let him free you. Just believe, friends. That's all you have to do. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we go into this next song, oh God, there's nowhere else I'd rather be than here in your arms, God, in your arms of love in your arms of forgiveness, in your arms of hope, in your arms of being. If you're watching online this morning, you raise your hands right where, wherever you are, and God will meet you. He's running to your living room. He's running to your home. He's running to that hospital bed. He's running to you, friends. And he says, oh my gosh, look at oh, They want more of me. I got more for you, friends. You go ahead and be able to sing. We're just going to get into it. I want more. Just be, just give it to him, friends. Say, Lord, I just want more of you. So I'm running. I'm running with my addiction. I'm running with my fear. I'm running with my bondage. I'm running with my anger. I'm running to you, God, because I need you. And I know you're running to me. You draw near to him. He will draw near to you. You seek him with all your heart. You're going to find him, friends. Oh, God, thank you for these hearts today.
today. Would you meet them right where they're at? In Jesus' name.
So set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain, that I can't control I want more of you, God I want more of you, God So set a fire down and come on Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, How pleased is God in this moment to hear his people say, I'm yours. And so I felt that, so standing there, it was like a wind was moving like that. And it just, I just felt it just hit me and it kept going. And I shared this in the first service and I'll share it again. That what, what you have ran to God with, maybe it doesn't hit you right away. But it'll hit you tomorrow when you'll need it. When that old thing comes after you, that you just said, I want to say no to this, and I want to say yes to God. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit will be there. And you'll have a choice to make in that moment. And so the, what I love about this song, is set a fire down in my heart. Then in Leviticus chapter 6, it talks about the priest's job was never to allow the fire to go out. And so what they would have to do is they would have to take the ashes, collect the ashes, and put them outside. Then before they were going to start their duties again to put the new wood in, they had to put new clothes on. And it was a symbolism of the old being taken out and the new being put on, being equipped for the new day. And so they would put new firewood in. And so I just want to encourage you this morning, if you want God to do something, then don't let him do it with the old. Let him do something new in your life. It doesn't mean the old was bad, but it just means in order for you to continue moving, there may be new things that he wants to do. It may be a, a, a new choice, a new pattern. It may be a removal. It may be a, a transition here. And so just let him do that new thing in you. 
Because you may come to God and say, well, I want you to work with these ashes, and you can't make a fire with ashes. It's done. Let it be done. So if God has taken something, removed something from your life, it's done. Don't try to resurrect it and start it again. But let him give you something fresh. Let him give you something new. And I'll tell you, friends, there's nothing like the love of God. Lamentation says his mercies are new every morning. Think about that. Every morning, he said, I want to give you something new today. So, Father, we just consecrate this time to you, that we run to you, Lord, but more importantly, you run to us. So I ask, God, that whatever we had to let go of, Lord, it's dead. It's done. We're not going to give that life anymore, but we're asking for just a, a fire, a fresh fire in our lives to burn, burn clean, burn new, fresh, strong. So, Lord, it's not going to change us in this moment, Lord, but we're going to see changes, Lord, as we go home. Lord, there may be decisions we have to make, and tomorrow, Lord, all of a sudden, that old is going to come knocking, Lord, and, but your Holy Spirit's going to be with us and be able to set that fire and say, no, no I'm not going to do that. I'd rather do that. It's going to awaken us in the middle of the night. It's going to cause us to worship night and day, night and day. It's going to be so much more, just a greater awareness, presence of you in our lives. Thank you, God, always for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Thanks so much, worship team. Ben, what a pleasant surprise, buddy. Thanks for being my Superman today and rescuing us. Appreciate you. Excuse me. Kids, at this time, you are dismissed to meet Todd in the back. Thanks for worshiping with us. Again, I pray that what God is doing is not just a one-dimensional thing, but that our kids are experiencing the presence of God as well. <clears throat> if you are a guest here, maybe it's the first time you're watching online, my heart as your pastor is that we're not an entertaining church, but that we are an engaging church. There's such a difference. This is not performance-based. We don't worship and we don't preach to entertain you, but to lead you in a relationship with God. If you are a first-time guest, my name is Pastor Paul. I am the lead pastor here. I see a few unfamiliar faces. I would love to connect with you after the service today. I have a gift for you. And just, again, it's, it's not uh, invasive. It's not anything that uh, would uh, just pressure you, but it's simply just a way of saying thanks for for choosing to be with us today, and we just want to give you some information and let you decide uh, what questions to ask and what, uh, what you're, um, let you steer the conversation, and any information we can give you, we would love to do that. A couple of announcements that I want to make. Number one, we want to say welcome to Lydia Rose Ulchenbruns. Uh, so Pastor Hunter and Brittany are not here today. She was born at 5.30 a.m. on Thursday, and so we're excited to have her in our lives, uh, me as an uncle and then obviously as a pastor as well. So it's a double blessing. But if you're watching today, we just say congratulations, take the time to transition. And it's an important one because this is their third child. No longer, they're sw This is hard. You go from one-on-one -on -one to zone now. Because now they're outnumbered. There's more kids than parents. And so it's a transition. So enjoy it. We look forward to having you back with us. Uh, announcement uh, in front of you or nearby is a um, bulletin. So there's so many uh, great things that are happening. Believe it or not, it's March. Can we? That's crazy to think about how fast even 2021 is going. Uh, we had a great day sledding yesterday. So thank you for those of you that joined with us at the Kullstrom's home. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I think the adults had more fun than the kids. I really believe that. And so we had a great time. Uh, thank you to all you adults who helped make that happen and keeping uh, our kids and adults uh, safe. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And so we thank the Kullstrom's for making that happen. Uh, but we're going to have an ice fishing event uh, on March 13th. And so we have a lot of uh, great ice fishermen and women here that have all the supplies that you need. And so if you want to bring your ice fishing stuff, you're welcome to do that. There's no cost to attend. You simply just have to have your fishing license unless you're a kid. But um, we have the supplies that you need, so come on out. All the information is in there for the bulletin. I look forward to doing that. Uh, and believe it or not, there's not much time left on the ice. And so I'm, I'm, I'm actually excited about that. That's okay for that. But let's enjoy the ice a little bit longer. If you want to join with us, uh, we would love to have you March 13th. 
And so before we get into my, my message, I just want to talk a little bit about where we're at as a church, because we have a lot of new faces, and with those new faces come different places and different backgrounds. And so I just wanted to take a moment to share with you with what happened last week. So if you weren't here last week, uh, we had a, just a powerful move of the Holy Spirit, and he changed directions on where we were going to go. And so when we talk about the Holy Spirit moving, when I talked about today, like I felt the Holy Spirit, for some of us, you're tracking with me, but for some of you, that may be a very new thing, an unfamiliar thing, and with unfamiliarity, there could be a little uncomfortableness, and you know what? That's okay, and so it's my job and my privilege as the pastor to help walk you through that. And so we're proud of being a Pentecostal church. We're proud to be pro-Holy Spirit. It means that the Holy Spirit wasn't just for the first New Testament church, but the Holy Spirit still is active and present in our life today. And believe it or not, he's more active than you might be aware. But as we teach you, and we're going to do this. So after Easter, we're going to spend the next couple weeks talking about the Holy Spirit and leading up to Pentecost Sunday. We're going to talk about who the Holy Spirit is the works of the Holy Spirit, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, so that everyone in here can know exactly what we're talking about, and then as you become aware of who the Holy Spirit is in your life, all of a sudden you're like, oh, yeah, I felt that before, but I didn't know that was the Holy Spirit, and what that's going to do, it's going to move you closer in your relationship with God, and so I'm excited about it. So when you hear words or terminologies like that, uh, don't be afraid of it. The only thing I would say is don't say no. And as you say yes to God, uh, and he'll move you forward. He'll move you forward. He'll get you to take that next step. But it's my responsibility as the pastor to help show you in God's word just how powerful and wonderful the Holy Spirit is and how you need the Holy Spirit in your life. So I look forward. So if you know anybody or maybe that's you, then following Easter, we're just going to hit the Holy Spirit hard. But until then, you don't wait till after Easter to experience the Holy Spirit. You can experience him now if you simply do what you did today and said, Lord, I want more of you. If you want more of God, I promise you, he will be uh, more than happy to give you everything that you need. And so in front of you or nearby, you can grab your notes. We're going to get started. We'll just bypass the bumper, John. It's okay. But as you grab your notes, I want you to look at your neighbor and say, it's, it's time to get real with how you feel. So I don't see Marvin. So it's time to get real with how you feel. We're talking about feelings. We're talking about emotions today. We're talking about our moods. And so... Emotions, they're not a bad thing. And it's important for us to come face to face with our emotions we deal with. As our emotions by themselves are not a bad thing. So being in a mood sometimes is not necessarily a bad thing. Okay, emotions are a good thing. To have no emotions would not be human. To have emotions is not just being human, but also it means you are made in the image of God. And guess what? Last week we shared that God has emotions, that he grieves over our sin. He rejoices when a sinner comes to repentance. He gets angry at sin. He is a jealous God. He's an all-consuming fire, so he has lots of different emotions. And guess what? If we are made in the image of God, it's not just our physical characteristic traits, but it's also our personality. It's our emotions. So emotions in God's hands can be a very powerful thing. But emotions anywhere else can get us into trouble. So last week, we talked about the emotion of anxiety. For all my anxious people out there, we shared the importance of learning to live in the open, meaning a lot of times we cause anxiety because we keep it to ourselves. We keep it in the dark. We would rather pretend with a mask on and think everything's okay, but underneath, really, we're screaming, anxiety. So bring it out into the open. Confess. Why? Because confession brings healing. Not only did we talk about living in the open, but we talked about the importance of uh, choosing to focus or magnifying the good. That means we, ha we, at any moment in time, can focus on what we give worth to. So am I going to give worth to my trouble? Am I going to give worth to my worry, to my anxiety? Or am I going to give worth to the faithfulness of God? We need to protect our emotions because we value our emotions. We get insurance on our house and our car Life insurance policy, because we value that. Well, we need to value our emotions as well. And so the more we protect what comes in, what we allow to influence our, our thoughts, then our emotions change because we're learning to value it and protect it. If you missed this message, you can see all of it on our Facebook page, on our website, on YouTube. 
But I encourage you to watch that message. And today we're going to focus on anger. Just as anxiety can pop up at any moment, so can anger. I, I can't remember in the 42 years that I've been living, I've never seen our nation so angry. But unfortunately, I have to be honest, I've never seen the church, God's people, so angry as I have this past year. It's been amazing just to see how people's mood changed because of the circumstances of our time. And we live in a very instant society where our emotions just instantly flare up. I've never seen it so quick. But emotions itself, friend, is not a bad thing. Anger by itself in God's hands is not a bad thing. We look at David, and when Goliath was defying God, he was making fun of God, and the Israelites were in fear. David wasn't in fear. What was he? He was angry. He said, you come after me at sword and spear, but I come after you in the name of the Lord. I defy you as you're defying my God. So that was a good thing. Jesus, as he goes into the temple, sees his people having a hard time getting to God. They're taking advantage of them, jacking up the prices so they can't offer their sacrifices. What does Jesus do? He makes a whip and whoosh, get out of here. Throws over the tables and he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of robbers. He was angry. So anger itself is not a bad thing, but it's when we mishandle our anger that it becomes a tool of the enemy. So Proverbs 29, 11 says this, a fool gives full vent to his spirit. I saw Tim. I don't know if I saw Carrie, but where is Tim Peterson? Hi, I saw your sign today at Super 8. I'm like, yes, they're tracking with me today. That was awesome to see that. A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. And so what is a fool? A fool is someone who acts unwisely or recklessly. So I want to talk about three different kinds of anger right now, and I want to see which one you are. Okay, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or come forward or anything. This is just an honest evaluation to help wake you up. All right, so are you like this picture? Go ahead, John, and pull that up. Is that a representation? If you're in the overflow section, you can't see it, but it's a volcano. And so a volcano, when it erupts, it just... And it goes everywhere and affects everything that touches it and where's it land. So again, don't raise your hand. But maybe you're not like a volcano. You're like the second picture. Go ahead and bring that up, John. All right, so if you're in the overflow section, it's an iceberg. And so it's really teeny tiny on top. But look at how much is underneath. And so for some of you, you're not an outward demonstration type person when it comes to anger. But man, you know how to sulk like the best of them. You give silent treatments like a pro. And you're the worst ones because we know something's wrong and you're not saying anything. And you know what it feels like? It feels like ice. There's just a cold feeling in the room. Now, volcanoes and icebergs, neither one of these are good. This is where I want you to be today. I want your anger to be like a stepping stone. And as you learn, first of all, when we mishandle, we become reckless, it becomes a stumbling block. But eventually, I want to help you get to where you now can use that anger in a way that glorifies God, and it's going to get you to where God wants you to be. He wants to bring the, the blessings that come with handling your anger in a wise way. So that's where I want all of us to be today, and it's simply by how you handle your anger. It's, I'm not saying you can't be angry today. You just need to know how to use your anger. And I want to tell you up front, this is something that I struggle with. I'll just be transparent. I'm not very much an anxious person, but anger uh, is something that I am continuing to work on, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. We just need to know how to use anger, and the best way to use it is to put it in God's hands. Why? Because Romans 8.28 says, and God causes all things together to work for what? For good. So God wants to use your emotions in a good way. He wants to cause it to work for good on behalf of you and on behalf of the lives of others, the people that you connect with, the people that you influence on a day-to-day -day basis. So you change your mood by changing your method. That's a fill in the blank. Why do I say method? Why do I not say message? Well, the message never changes. God's word stays the same. So if God's word stays the same, and something's not working in your life, then maybe it's the method that which you're using. 
So if you want your mood to change, then change your method. That's what I'm going to help you with today, help you get to change the method by following God's word that never changes. Are you carrying anger in your life today? Maybe it's openly or maybe it's subtly. That's my prayer for you today, to look from the Bible and be wise with your emotions. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you're running to us. You're, you never stop. David said, surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. So it's not even we're running after that, but they're chasing us down. So thank you that you are a loving father that never gives up, but you always see the potential. You don't see us as we are, but you see us what we can be. Lord, if we'll simply just say yes to you and run to you. So we do that today. And Lord, if there's anyone struggling in the area of anger, Lord, I pray that as we change the method by looking at your message, God, that our mood would change. And Lord, that it would not just change us, but it would change the relationships around us, God. And so we can't do that without you. So give us ears to hear, minds to process what we're hearing, and Lord, faith to put it into practice, not just to be hearers, not to be entertained or hear a good message, but Lord, to do something with it, God, that's going to change our life. Like those stepping stones, God, it's going to put us on that good path. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I want to give you three questions to ask yourself when anger pops up in your life. And the first question you need to ask yourself, first of all, is should I be angry? I want to tell you this morning, not everything should offend you. I'm I'm sorry, but we live in a society where it just seems like everybody is offended by everything. And we can't do that. There's lots of things that will work up your anger, but you have to choose your battles. So I look at my own life, and and like I said, anger is something that that I'm, I'm still working on. And it's Not in the major things. Like I said, in the major things, I'm calm. I'm cool. I'm collect. And the fact is, it's it's bringing up anxiety in Sarah's life. Because she's like, why aren't you anxious? Why why aren't you angry? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? I said, I'm fine. And it surprises her. But man, you do something that's just petty, that doesn't make a difference. It's small. It's minor. And then Pastor Paul, I'll just tell you right now. You probably know I'm more of a volcano than an iceberg. I don't, I'm not very subtle, am I? But it's something minor. It's, not, it's something that I shouldn't be angry at, but yet I am. Don't believe me? Ask Sarah. No, don't. I don't see her in the room, so you're just going to have to take my word for it. But in those moments, I'm foolish, and I act unwisely. So when offense happens and your anger starts to build, what I want you to do is I don't want you to act. All I want you to do in this moment is to think and ask yourself in the moment, should I be angry? Is this something I should be offended by? Because you have in the moment the ability to choose what follows next. But often we miss it because we act instead of think. So I just want to show you in God's word how to handle offense wisely. And so two weeks ago, we talked about conflict. And you're like, why are we talking about this again? Because conflict has to do with what's happened and how you treat other people. This is internally. This is a self-evaluation. This has to do more with you than the other person. It's dealing with your emotions. So in Daniel chapter 1, and really I'm doing Daniel chapter 1 to Daniel chapter 4. I don't have time to read the entire four chapters, but I do encourage you to read it this week. So here's the backstory. This is how Daniel gets set up. The Israelites were defeated by the Babylonians. So King Nebuchadnezzar, what they would do, every king that defeats the other king, he would take all their stuff. He would take the best of the cattle or the treasure. But Nebuchadnezzar didn't just do that. He says, you know what? I want to weaken the Israelites so much that I'm going to take their best. I'm going to take their brightest. And I'm going to immerse them in our Babylonian culture so they'll forget about their culture and they'll embrace mine. And so the Israelites don't have a choice. They're defeated. And so they've been taken captive from their homeland. And they've been transplanted where Nebuchadnezzar lives. That should anger them. Another thing he wants to do is he says, I want you to forget about your God. I want you to forget about your religion. But I want to teach you the Babylonian ways. I want to teach you about our culture, our religion. And they could have gotten offended at that too. And then all of a sudden, on top of that, he says, you know what? I don't even like your Israelite names. So I'm going to give you Babylonian names, heathen names. 
I like my name, Paul. I don't want to be called Harry. But if King Nebuchadnezzar says, you're Harry, not Paul, there's not much I can do about it. Because I have to, I have been transplanted from my homeland. I'm being immersed in this culture, and now I have a different name. And at any of those points, you think there was some offense that happened with Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. Anybody, anybody be okay if I took you from your home and put you in a different place? Anybody be okay if I said, you know what? Your religion, your heritage, gone. This is who you are now. Anybody be like, oh, sure, I'm okay with that. Any of you not like your names and actually would like a name change for a change? I can do that if you really want. No, but you like your name. So at any point, they could have been offended. They could have been angry. But there's not one scripture that I could tell you that tells me that they were. Why? Because they chose their battles. Because they acted wisely. They could have got offended, but they didn't. They don't get angry. They don't throw a fit. They just roll with it. And I wonder how many situations in our life could we avoid if we simply learned to, by asking this question, should I be angry? But here's why we don't. Because in the moment we deal with the what rather than dealing with the why. Okay, let me give you an example. This is a, I said it in the first service, it's a totally hypothetical situation. But Sarah comes home and I'm hungry. And she got me a, a meal, but she forgot to supersize the fries. And she forgot the ranch. Then all of a sudden, pshhh, asking the question, why am I angry? Because the what is the supersizing the fries. But you know what? That's not why I'm angry. Why I'm angry is my wife doesn't respect me. I'm angry because I do so much around here for her. How could she not do this for me? That's the why. The why feels disrespected. The why is, why is hurt because, you know what? I love her enough that I wouldn't have forgotten the fries of the ranch. She must not love me. Do you see how ridiculous that is? But that is the why behind the what. Oftentimes we deal with the what. I'm offended. This happened. I'm angry. And I go after it in anger. But you know what? That doesn't help because we never deal with the why. It's dealing with the root, but not the, excuse me, the fruit, but not the root. So I'm not really mad that she didn't supersize the fries or the ranch. The why is I feel disrespected. I feel she doesn't love me. And again, my wife and I are good. It's totally hypothetical. You can ask her about it. But this is what happens when we don't stop and ask ourselves why. Am I angry? Should I be angry? The Bible says the hearts of the wise make their mouths prudent and their lips promote instruction. So right off the bat, I don't want you to deal with your mouth and how you express your emotions. I want you to just deal with the heart of it. The why am I angry? Should I be angry? Friends, not everything should offend you. Not everything should anger you. But if you're the kind of person that's always angry and offended about at everything, then you need to look at the why. Don't, don't act, think. And that's exactly what these men did because I cannot give you scripture at their offense, but I can tell you what happened well when Nebuchadnezzar transplanted them. I can tell you what happened when Nebuchadnezzar got them immersed in their culture. I can tell you what happens to these guys when their names are changed and they handle it wisely. I can give you scripture there. Verse 17 says this, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. See, if they would have gotten offended, if they would have got angry, if they would have thrown a fit, if they would have just been just horrible to Nebuchadnezzar, this would have never happened. It goes on to say that he found none equal to them. So there was favor in Nebuchadnezzar's eyes with these four men because they knew how to handle their offense wisely. At some point as they're walking in exile, I'm sure God's speaking to them and says, you know what, I'm with you. Don't get angry. These things are going to happen. Don't be offended. Just let this happen. Get it in your heart. It's going to be okay. I got things that I'm going to do through this. 
if you'll just handle yourself well. And these four men did. They dealt with the why, not just the what. And for some of you in here, you're going to avoid so much if you just learn to stop acting and be more proactive in your thinking in dealing with the why and not just the what. Choose your battles. So important to choose your battles because not everything is a battle. Okay? So sometimes you're going to have to just bypass the offense and say, you know what? This is not worth engaging in. But there may be times that you are going to have to engage, and this is my second point. If you decide to engage, then you're going to have to just ask the question, where will this lead me? Okay? Should I be angry? No. Okay, then let's move on in peace. Should I be angry? Yes. Okay, I'm going to engage in this. What's going to happen because of this? So this is what happens. Every choice you make puts you on a path, good or bad. And when your anger flares up, you have to look beyond the moment. But we don't do this. We're a society of instant reaction. We don't think long term. But if you want to think long term, then you have to learn to settle your spirit. Settle your spirit. This is Daniel chapter 3 now. These same men who don't engage in their relocation or their name change, they decide there's one thing that I should engage with. There's one thing that is making me angry, and I won't stand for it. Well, literally, they do stand for it, but they don't, if you know what I'm saying. So what happens in Daniel chapter 3, these same men are watching Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar, he gets this big head. He puts this parade on. He thinks he's a pretty big deal. He lets his pride get to him. He builds a statue of himself, and he calls for all his friends and all the people and say, guess what? Today is King Nebuchadnezzar Day. So let's celebrate me. And so what I want you to do is we're going to have some fun music playing on. As you hear the music play, why don't you just do this, do me a favor, make me feel good, and bow down to the statue. And we'll call it King Nebuchadnezzar Day. Music starts playing. Everybody gets into it. Again, they're not even thinking. They're just acting. But we got Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego standing. And friends, I want to tell you, I believe we're living in a day when we're called to stand while the rest of the world bows. It's time for the church to stand. I really believe that we are in these times to shine the love of God, to stand for what's true and for what's right and to not conform. And so these three men do this. And what happens? Somebody snitches on them. Said, hey, hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those are your guys, right? But they're not bowing. Does Nebuchadnezzar ask himself the question, should I be angry? No. Does Nebuchadnezzar ask the question, where is this going to lead me? No. What does he do? The Bible says he gets mad. He engages. He calls them out in front of everyone. He's in the heat of the moment. He's furious. That's what the Bible says, furious with rage. Verse 13, he summons Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar says to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the, I, the, worship the image I have made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. This is where he gets petty. He gets personal. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? He threatens them. He taunts them. He says, I dare you. You think your God's going to save you? Don't you know who I am? Don't you see my statue? I'm a pretty big deal. Who's going to rescue you? Here's three men, entire nation taunting them, threatening them. They could have been angry. They could have been petty. They could have got caught up in the heat of the moment. And I want to ask you this morning, how do you react when you're taunted, when you're threatened, when somebody makes fun of you, when somebody calls you out, when somebody dares you? Oh, buddy, it's on. It's on. Let's go. Let's go. Throw the first punch. Right? No. That's how we do it, but that's not how these three guys did it. Because when we're unsettled, we become unhinged. I want you to hear that again. 
When your spirit is unsettled, then you become unhinged. In our anger, we go after the moment without giving any thought to what the long-term effect is behind it. You get so caught up in that battle, that argument, that fight, that offense, you're so caught up, blinded by the moment, that you're not thinking, your, your spirit's not settled enough to see how is this going to affect me in the long run. But thank the Lord that we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to learn from. So in verse 16, same chapter, Daniel 3. This is how they reply. King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. So they're saying, we're not going to engage in this back and forth. I hear what you're saying. But if we're thrown into the blazing fire, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Why? Because their spirit is settled and they're able to think long term. They said, in this moment, if I, if I bow down, then this is what I'll be losing. I'll be losing my relationship with God. I'll be losing my testimony by compromising. They were thinking long term. They didn't care about the moment. They didn't care about being thrown into the fire. They said, God may deliver us. He may not, but that doesn't make a difference. I'm thinking long term. So I would rather have a long relationship with God in a short earthly life than a short relationship with God in a long earthly life. Are you hearing me this morning? You have to be able to answer the question, where is this going to lead me? So when you're angry, when you're offended, when you decide that this is something that you're going to engage in, it could be with your spouse, it could be with your kids, it could be with your job, it could be in the church community. And you decide, I'm going to engage in this, this is worth engaging, then you have to settle your spirit in that moment to think about how this is going to affect me long term. Sherry and I may have a difference of opinion in the moment, but in my heart, she means more to me than this disagreement. So I'm thinking long-term, how do I preserve this relationship with Sherry? We may differ on positions, but I'm not going to disrespect her as a person because I value this relationship long-term. Friends, I said this this morning. If you don't learn how to deal with relationships on earth, how do you think heaven is going to be like? You think God is just going to magically get everybody to get along? Why do you think he gives us church? So we can practice it here. And for some of you, you're going to be at heaven. You're going to be walking up. What a day, glory. said, oh, my gosh. I didn't know you were going to be here. And and what are they going to say? You know what? I'm a little bit honest. I didn't think you were going to be here either. But friends, the church is a place where we should get it right. A new command I give you. The world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And the only way we're going to do that is we start thinking better when it comes to long term. We can disagree on positions without disrespecting the person. Because why? Long term. This is a moment. We'll get through this. But you mean more to me. Husbands, your spouses better know she means more to you than your position. Parents, your kids better know that they mean more to you than the moment, the position that you're taking. But we have to be proactive in thinking long term and not just the moment. Because when our spirit is settled, we have a better handle on the situation. When our spirit is settled, we get a clearer perspective. When we settle our spirit, it preserves the relationship. That's what happens when you put anger in God's hands. He can cause it to work for good. So what what does Daniel chapter 3 say? Then all of a sudden, Nebuchadnezzar leaps from his chair and he's like, oh my gosh, I just kicked him into the fire and there was three. Now there's four. And they're not burnt. They're just kind of walking around and saying, oh, this is different. (laughs) I never knew what the inside of fire looked like. And Nebuchadnezzar's like, you guys got to get them out of here. I got to know what just went on. People just don't walk through fire. And it says they come out, not even smelling like smoke. And so Nebuchadnezzar changes his tune. 
The God that he taunted, all of a sudden he says, don't anybody make fun of their God. Doesn't say that he comes to be a Christian, but seeds were planted. He says, if you mess with their God, I'll cut you up to pieces. And you know what happens long term? They get another promotion. So they were promoted in Daniel chapter 1, and now they're promoted again in Daniel chapter 3. Why? Because they were putting their anger in God's hands. They were not foolish. They were not acting recklessly. Their spirit was settled. They knew how to deal with the why and not just the what. Which brings me to my last point. There will be moments that you mess up. There will be moments you don't think of the why. There will be moments when you don't think long term and you just get in the moment. So the last question you have to ask yourself is, how do I make this right? God causes all things to work together for good. That means in the moments we get right, in the moments we don't get right. But God will give you a second chance. Until your last breath is taken, he will give you those opportunities to make it right. In making it right, I'll tell you there will be moments you will hear something you don't always want to hear. You won't. But just because it offends you or angers you doesn't mean it's wrong. So here's something crucial when it comes to those of you that are dealing with anger and you hear something you don't want to hear, but you want to make it right. Here's how you make it right. Don't let pride in. Don't let pride and anger be friends. The more you hold out on doing the right thing, the more opportunity you give pride to have a foothold in your life. Last week, we talked about valuing, protecting the things we value. I want to encourage you today to protect humility. Let humility be a value in your life. Three H's that I I share from the pulpit for us as a church. Number one, I want us to be hungry. That means we're constantly running after God. But the second H has to do with being humble. That's not about us. It's about him. But we need to walk in humility. And the third one is to handle others well. There's no room for pride in this church. There's no room for me as a pastor to have pride. In your arena, in your walk of life, do not let pride and anger be friends. So Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar, he has this dream And he calls for Daniel to interpret it. Remember in Daniel chapter 1, it says that he gave him the ability. God gave Daniel the ability to interpret dreams. So here we see it coming forth. He calls for Daniel to interpret it. And so Nebuchadnezzar tells Daniel this dream. And this is what Daniel says. This dream is about you, Nebuchadnezzar. That you're great. That you're mighty. That you have all these things. What a great day to be you. But be careful Because God is going to take this away from you. Because you think it's all about you and you don't give God credit. He's going to take it about you and he's going to make you like a wild beast. So he hears something. Nebuchadnezzar hears something that he doesn't want to hear. And I wonder how many of us like hearing what we don't want to hear. Anybody like to hear what they don't want to hear? We always enjoy, oh, just tell me how wrong I am. Love it. You're difficult to work with. Oh, I'm going to chew that up. You're a maniac. Oh, that makes me feel so good. Don't we love hearing stuff like that? How imperfect we are? We just love. No, yeah, no, we don't. So how do you think Nebuchadnezzar feels in this moment? But you know what Daniel's doing? He's trying to help Nebuchadnezzar make it right. So look at what verse 27 says. Therefore, your majesty Be pleased to accept my advice. So he's like, Jeff, just listen to me. Man, I care about you. You're a good guy, good dad, good husband. Just listen to me on this one. Because he cares. He cares about Nebuchadnezzar. So this is what he tells him to do. Renounce your sin by doing what is right. And your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. So he said, I don't want your prosperity to end. I only want good things for you, but in order for these good things to happen, you've got to make it right. 
How do we make it right? Repent. Give the glory to God. So it says that Nebuchadnezzar does, and there's revival in the land. It doesn't say that. Scripture does say that a year later, Nebuchadnezzar is just strolling on his rooftops. He's like, man, this is a glorious day. And he looks out and says, oh, look at everything. This is mine. How great I am for all these wonderful things to happen. Oh, I'm so cool. I'm so awesome. I'm, I'm that and then some. And then the Bible says before he could even finish his words, everything that Daniel predicted, a voice came from heaven and everything that was spoken in the dream was fulfilled. His kingdom is taken away from him. He's run out of the kingdom. He's hanging out in the fields, munching on some grass. He's got this long hair and long nails. He's like some Sasquatch-looking guy. And then it clicks in Nebuchadnezzar's mind what Daniel says. And it said that immediately when Nebuchadnezzar began to praise God, his sanity came back. Can I tell you that pride is insanity? Pride will never do you any good. It will never work to your advantage. It will never get you what you want. So if that is true, then why do we hold on to pride for so long? All it's doing is making us insane. People look at you like you're insane. Like why are you holding on to that position? Why do you keep defending yourself? Because we don't value humility. Because we've allowed our anger and our pride to become friends. But Proverbs 11.2 says, when pride comes, do you know what happens when pride comes? Then comes disgrace. So if you want to hold on to pride, go ahead. But guess what's coming? Disgrace. It's only when you are humble will you receive wisdom. So if you want to make things right and you don't know how, then you need to get wisdom. But in order to get wisdom, you need to have humility. You need to say, you know what? I'm not right. You know what? I'm wrong. God, you are right. And then boom, what happens? Like Nebuchadnezzar, his sanity is restored. How do I make things right? Make humility a value in your life. It's not about who wins. It's not about who holds out the longest. Because the more time passes in anger, the more pride gets a foothold. Humility is more powerful up front. So if you need some power in your life, then be humble. You'll get a whole dose of power when you learn to be humble. Why? Because God gives grace to the humble, but he opposes the proud. The only thing that follows pride is disgrace. But humility comes wisdom. So I want you to humble yourself this week in the moment of your offense, of your anger. I dare you to say these words to somebody that they've been wanting to hear. You're right, and I was wrong. Then boom, they pass out. They're not even going to remember the conversation. Did you say you were right? Um, no. <laughs> yeah, of course I said you're right. Why? Because I'm valuing wisdom. I need that wisdom to make it right. Why? Because when I make it right, then it helps me secure long term. Not everything everyone will say will be right. But don't be so prideful that you assume everyone is wrong. Okay? Not everybody's going to get it right 100% of the time. But don't assume everyone's wrong. Everyone needs a Daniel in their life. You need a Daniel. I need a Daniel. So I'm going to ask you this morning, who is the Daniel in your life? The older I get, the more I value those people. Not just telling me what I want to hear, but what I need to hear. So I need to know that I have someone that's got my back that's going to speak into my life to help make it right. To help me see what I don't see because I may be blinded by ambition or blind, blinded by my selfishness or blinded by my fear, whatever it is. And I need a Daniel saying, hey, if you keep going that way, this is what's going to happen. Then it's up to me to choose how do I respond but everybody needs a Daniel. So get a Daniel in your life. And I close by saying this. This week, 
Don't be so hasty. Don't be so hasty. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. So this week, slow your roll. Slow down. Don't act. Don't react. First of all, think. Why am I angry? The why behind the what. Then if you decide to engage, again, don't act, don't react. Think, okay, I'm going to engage in this. This is the moment. This is what's going to happen. But how do I handle myself in the long run? If I say this to Sherry, what's it going to do to my relationship? If I do this to Mark, what's going to happen to our relationship? Again, it doesn't mean we're not going to engage, but it helps us put perspective. Settle our spirits first, because I'm not just thinking about the moment. I care about these individuals. I think about the long term. Don't act. Don't react in the moments when you hear something you don't want to hear. Or if you mess up, how am I going to make this right? Well, I got to make it right. So that means I got to humble myself, which is a hard thing to do. But pride is insanity, friends. Look what it did to Nebuchadnezzar. And he had that wisdom up front. He could have avoided all of it. He could have made it right like that. But his pride kept him from the wisdom, from the blessing. But immediately when he was humbled and he gave glory to God, his sanity was restored. So don't be so hasty, friends. Learn to be slow to anger. So I just want you to bow your heads this morning. If you're watching online, you can do the same wherever you're at. I just have to ask the question, where are my angry people at? Just raise your hand. Again, you don't have to be embarrassed of the emotion. It's a godly thing. It's just when we mishandle it, we get ourselves into trouble. So again, now that you know anger is not a bad thing, and you got an anger buddy in Pastor Paul, would you raise your hand? Yeah. It's all right. So let's work on our anger this week. Let's not major in the minor. So we're going to choose our battles. Okay? Why am I angry? This week we're going to examine the whys more than just going with the whats. This week... If we choose this is worthy of engaging in, then I need to get my spirit settled before I even, before you even go into something. Settle your spirit. Get your conscience clear before God. Say, God, I'm about to do this. I'm about to say this. What do you think? Does this sound right? Am I doing this the right way? Am I doing this in a way that glorifies you? Am I doing this in a way that honors others? Okay. Because I'm not just looking in the moment. I'm going to look at the moments behind the moment and moving forward. For some of you, you've messed up and you just need to make it right. I purposed in my heart that I wouldn't just share all my victories, but as a pastor, I would share my struggles. Because we can learn just as much from defeat as we can from victories. And so I want my kids to know that I want to lead the way in showing them how to say I'm sorry. I want my wife to know that she means more to me than my pride, than being right. I want you guys to know, as your pastor, it's not about being right. It's about moving forward together in unity. So I want to lead the way as your pastor, moments I mess up, to say I'm sorry. Okay? Because when we do those things, we're putting our anger in God's hands. And he can cause all things together to work for good. So whether you are a volcano or you are an iceberg, right now, how can that you become a stepping stone? And once you start making those good choices, then God's going to put another stone there. And it's going to put you on this path to blessings. It's going to put you on a path to healthier relationships. It's going to put you on a path to a healthier you. It's going to make you stronger. 
It's going to make you more of a Daniel that can speak into the lives of others because you're healthy. The healthier you are, I want to tell you this morning, the healthier those around you will become. The healthier your relationships will be. The healthier your job will be. This can apply to any arena in your life. So how many of you say, Pastor Paul, I have anger issues and I need to work on one, two, or all three of these? Would you just raise your hand? I'm not going to ask you to step forward. I am going to ask you to do this. Oh my gosh, I knew I shouldn't have raised my hand. I knew that he does stuff like this. No, you don't have to be afraid. But I do want you to ask God to bring you a Daniel. We all need a Daniel in our lives. Someone that we can just hash things out with. Someone that we can just say, hey, you know what? I'm angry about this. I don't understand this. Why am I angry? And just kind of just bounce things off each other. So I want to pray for your anger, but I want to pray that God brings a Daniel into your life. And I also pray that you would become a Daniel for others. So Father, thank you for our emotions. How boring life would be if we were all the same And if we had no feelings and we were just more like robots, God, and just kind of went with everything and did everything that you told us and there would be nothing to it. But thank you, God, for our emotions. Thank you that you have emotions. And so, Lord, I just pray where we get our emotions wrong, when we mishandle them, forgive us. So, Lord, we just put those anger issues before you right now And Lord, we ask in humility that you would just begin to work those things in our life, those issues. Lord, I pray that as we humble ourselves, that that wisdom would come and you would show us the why. And not just focus on the what, but the why. To bring those things forth. Okay, this is why I'm angry. I'm hurt. Okay, this is why I'm angry. I feel disrespected. Okay, this is why I'm hurt, because you didn't believe me. Okay, this is why I'm hurt. So all of a sudden, now comes the why, and that's what we really deal with, not just the what. Lord, help us work through those issues, God, when we just short fuses, my short fused brothers and sisters, Lord, myself included, God, where we don't think long term, we're in the moment, God. I pray, Lord, this would be a week of settling our spirits. Lord, your peace would come over that that moment, that offense, that anger, and just quench it. Lord, so we can just be settled in that moment to say, okay, yep, we're offended. Okay, yep, we're angry, but where is this going to lead? If you say that, what's it going to do? If you're going to do that, where is it going to go? So, Lord, we're going to have a clearer perspective. Lord, you're going to enlarge our vision to not just see the moment, but the moments after. And for those of us that have messed up, Lord, we... Pride has got to go. So I pray that we would break that relation, that relationship with pride. So, Lord, that humility can come in. And, Lord, that we can just go to someone that needs to hear these words. I'm sorry. I was wrong. I hurt you. I, I, I got in the moment. I was offended. No excuse. And here's why. And so, Lord, I just pray in any relationships that need to be worked out, God, I pray that humility would be a strong part of part of this church would be a part of our culture, Lord. It's not about who wins or loses, God. It's not about who holds out the longest, God. It's not about who can be this or that, Lord. It's just we're walking in humility because we value each other. Lord, we want to live our lives that glorify you. So help us to do that, Lord. Help us not to be hasty this week. Just calm our spirits, God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would calm America, that you would calm our nation with everything that's going on. Lord, calm our political leaders, Lord, our our. Our national government, calm our our state officials. Lord, would you calm your people? The most calm, peaceful people should be Christians. So Lord, forgive us for being all riled up. Lord, and just again, that peace would just come over your people, God, because Lord, you're with us. You're running to us. Lord, we're running to you. So Lord, we just give our anger to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm just going to ask you to stand this morning as we close in a word of prayer. I want to tell you, I love you. More importantly, Jesus loves you. There's nothing you can do about it. Might as well accept it. I promise you, you won't regret it. But if anger is something or you're dealing with something, you just need some extra prayer, some encouragement. Maybe you want to bounce some things off me. Uh, happy to do those things with you. We don't 
uh, we don't collect offerings, so offerings is a box. If you want to put offering in the back, you're welcome to do that. But thanks for being a part. Thanks for coming out on a Sunday. Thanks uh, for being here on a, a gorgeous day. I was, I was excited to see the parking lot today. Anybody else excited to see asphalt? <laughs> that was actually cool. Seeing grass, even though it's brown, you're starting to see grass. It's giving you a little bit of hope. You know, spring's coming. I want to tell you, for each of you this morning, the new is coming. It's here. Continue to let it work in your life. So, Lord, bless my brothers and sisters as they go their separate ways, Lord. Thanks for each gift, each giver, Lord. I, I think about as we see the, the offerings coming in, Lord, and it's not just the moment, but you're building, Lord, for moments to come, Lord. I believe there's much work to be done. So thanks for allowing us to be a part of it in this season, God, what you're doing in Bemidji First Assembly of God and what you have yet to do, God. We're so excited. So bless each gift, each giver, Lord. As everybody goes, Lord, let them be safe. Let them be healthy. Lord, let them be bold, God. Be bold, God, in, in, in their testimony, God. I pray that we're a testimony church, and we need to hear testimonies. We need to proclaim the good things that you are doing, Lord. So let this be a week of just declaring how great you are. And we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for watching us online as well. We love you so much. Have a great day. And Lord willing, we will see you uh, next week.